All right, this is Jeff Peterson, the Interstate of Music Podcast. I've got a couple guests here, uh, singers, songwriters. We got Bryce Long, we got Mark Nessler. Welcome to the show, guys. Appreciate having. Thanks you. for having us. For man. sure. So I want to start this off a little bit more of not necessarily what you're up to now, but how the hell you got to what you're doing now. Back when you were first starting, how long have you guys been just playing music individually? I mean, did you start when you were five years old, or was this a co you know? college gig kind of a thing or a high school band bryce when when, when did Man, it all start I, for you you know for me I, I had a grandmother that played piano and uh my dad's whole side of the family was musical so ever since i was a kid i mean music was a part of what we did and you know all the time really but my grandmother played in, in church as well and i, I mean i'd probably say four or five when she kind of had me up singing you know so, so you started more singing than playing an instrument or were you like a yeah. – did you have to learn piano because she knew it? Well, I no, but oddly enough, I, now I, I would have given anything if I would have learned to play right. piano with her because she played by ear and, you know, just could play anything and, um, you know, real versed in all the old hymns and stuff. Sure. I mean, just, you know, you call out two sharps or two flats or whatever to her and she'd go to town on, you know, just whatever song it was and um, – but I learned to play guitar, um, you know, uh, as a kid. My dad played guitar, you yeah. know, just chords and stuff. And my great uncle played fiddle. So when we got together at family uh, gatherings, be it, you know, pretty much everything we did, whatever it was. Kind of jam church, session. Uh, yeah, on Easter or any Christmas, Thanksgiving, any kind of, you know, family gathering. I mean, it was, we ate a great meal. My grandma was a great cook. Yeah. And, uh, and then we played music. I mean, that was kind of where it started for me at a real young age. And and the music that you were playing back then as a family, what were the influences? What were what were the songs that you were singing? I mean, were they church songs or were they? Well, there was a lot of church songs because because my my dad's side of the family, he had two sisters and a brother, and so they sang harmony really. Well. I mean, they all sang together and sang harmony okay. and stuff, and so there was a lot of church hymns singing. Uh, but then that's. I mean, country was, I grew up in Kentucky and country and bluegrass and that kind of thing was what, you know, kind of what it was all about for right. us. And, and it really, I think that's why, you know, I gravitated towards country so much. I mean, it was, you know, from Hank Sr. to the Haggard songs to the, right. you know, a Whip Whalen, all that kind of stuff back in those days. Uh, Jim Reeves, you know, I mean, sure. the, the early, early stuff and, and, um, and, you know, I mean, growing up around that, you, uh, we were a farm family as well, you okay. know, farmed a lot. So country was, I mean, that's who we were. Right. So country music really spoke to us. No, that's awesome. How about you, Mark? Well, sitting here listening to Bryce talk, I feel like we're brothers. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, I was seven years old when my dad bought me my first guitar. He had played music, not professionally, but he'd written a few songs and you know, and played bass in the Air Force band, you know, okay. and, and really had always dreamed of, you know, getting songs recorded, you know, by other artists and maybe even being an artist himself. But he in, ended up in Beaumont with um, a job at Bethlehem Steel and and uh, became a welder. And um, But I think he kind of started kind of living through me, you know. He was like a huge inspiration and so he taught me the seven basic chords on the guitar. And, okay. And from then on, it was like, because we were having jam sessions, you know, pretty regularly around the house on the weekend. Sure. Music was just always a part of, you know, what we did as a family. Right. Um, people coming and going with guitars and banjos and you know he loved bluegrass because he was from paducah kentucky and he introduced me to all that great music and so i started picking bluegrass we started traveling to festivals and you know over into louisiana i'm a texas boy so it was kind of hard to find some bluegrass pickers down well there, i was but... i was born in houston i just uh i lost that <laughs> uh that awesome accent when i was three and a half moving to the <laughs> northern surface of chicago but i can say i was born yeah, in houston so that's, that's something but i uh i just loved music and became fascinated with the song itself because right. that's what made me feel something and when I was 10 years old, I was listening to a Buck Owens uh, 45, 
and um, that's what really, you know, you know, kind of led me to writing songs because um, I was like, wow, somebody's got to write these songs. Right. Why can't that be me? Yeah. And the song was Tall Dark Stranger. I don't know if you remember that song. And so I wrote a song called I Am a Stranger. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. And I went to the living room where my dad was, check out this song, you know. And so that was my first brush with Did he say keep on trying or did he like no, it? No, <laughs> he said, boy, I think you might want to like, you know, change the title. <laughs> so that was my first warning when it comes to copyright. Yeah, so, right, right. But as I got older, and, you know, and I started experiencing life, you know, my songs got better and and uh and then of course i had to make a living right so i'm playing honky tonks and sure they're wanting you to play top 40 music and i realized Pretty later feel like a jukebox right yeah i'm like it really gave me a sense of what a hit song you know sounds like and so i wow what a way to take what a lot of musicians take is like the, the worst part of their career mm -hmm. you know playing cover songs and people are throwing out songs but to have that view at that point to say this is a hit and i want to figure out why yeah. and what's the consistency from what, this song to yeah, this song well, there, to this there's song. a formula there's know? a little and bit I, and i didn't really know that till i started you know just kind of breaking the songs down and sure everything and and my first songs you know i recorded in my little studio out beside the house it was a morgan building that i converted to a studio okay and i was probably 20 years old old and and at 24 i got an ed bruce cut on rca records and that was the moment when i i realized i can do this right uh, because up until that point you're like you know who's hearing this yeah how am i getting this how's this gonna to... work you right know? and then suddenly you, know, you get a single and you're hearing your song on the countdown I remember sitting in my truck. I mean, YouTube listening. wasn't. I mean, you you mm. you weren't becoming a YouTube star mm. back then. <laughs> so I mean, it was it was seriously like cutting those songs, getting them to somebody, finding out who knows somebody, exactly. getting it passed down the line, right. and, and hoping they happen to give it a listen. And how long do they listen? You know, five seconds, mm, ten seconds, right. twenty seconds. Yeah. And little did I know it would be ten years before I'd get my next single on Tracy Bird, Heaven in My Woman's Eyes. So I I experienced success i think considerably early uh, but i also learned that you can't take it for granted right because it can go away just as fast as it comes yeah. i mean the the term one hit wonders exists yeah. because it's a thing you know it's it happens to so many and that doesn't mean all the other songs aren't good mm -hmm. it just means you know right. how, how you're gonna make money doing mm -hmm. it you know is is the hits yeah. and that's the tough part so when you look when you look back, I mean, I, I listened to you guys just do a sound check. Did you guys take guitar lessons, and how did you learn to be as good as you are? I mean, is this literally self taught? And then when it came to you, talked about a studio. Where did you get your education on even knowing how to control the equipment to get a, a decent sound to put a, a the, track out there? The manual. <laughs> I mean, is that kind of? I mean, did you ever take guitar lessons? I didn't. I I did for a short period, and I just you know didn't feel I, right. I wasn't into it that much, to be sure. honest with you. So I didn't, you know, I didn't take. I just wanted to, man. I wanted to play the songs I heard on the radio. I didn't want to play, you know, this Mary had a little lamb, other, you know, yeah, one right. note at a time or whatever. I'm like, man, can we get through this? And like, can you teach me the chords to swinging doors? Because that's really what I want to know, right? You know, and and that's the, I mean, that's that's the reality of it. And I just kind of got burnt out, you know, it didn't take long to get bored with that. But, and, you know, and they and and I guess as a teacher goes, I mean, you, you know, for them, you, they think they have to start at the beginning and sure. kind of go through the you every know. and everybody's different, but it, and so many times they feel like they've got to bring all break it all the way down and all the way back up. And sometimes it's just you've got to know who you're. We were teaching. Yeah, and I, I mean, my whole thing was just trying to figure out how to play so I could sing along with it. Right. I mean, that's just the reality of it yeah. for me. I, I wanted to, you know, I wanted to be able to play what I was hearing on the radio, you know. Were and, you all, were you guys always, were you confident in your voice, in the vocals? Because so many people are like, oh, I'll play, but I don't want to get in front of a mic and sing. Were you guys confident in your I just vocals? loved it so much. I didn't, you know, you confidence, I don't know about that. I just, I mean, I think that comes with people, you know, 
going, hey, you did a good job, you know, church or whatever. Yeah, but, but some of those are on American Idol and they are terrible. Uh, well, I get it. I get it. But the reality of it was, is I just loved it, man. Yeah. I just loved the music. I loved to sing. And, and I, you know, I, I just loved everything about it. I mean, every part of it I loved. It's 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 something I sit there and I, and I, I clearly I'm not a musician. I don't sing, but I'm so intrigued by the industry and the musicians themselves and the hard work that goes behind it. And I sit there and I talk to different musicians and it seems that there's, there's an interesting characteristic and it, and I kind of phrase it this way. It's almost, there's an impatience and drive combination because you're talking about, I just want, I, I need to get to this. I want to do that. And then it's that drive to like do it your, yourself and figure it out on your own and get there because honestly, sometimes it feels like everybody else is holding you back from what you want to get to. So it seems like there's this impatience, but this this drive to get to that next spot. Does yeah. that make sense? For me, it was like I considered it a blessing and a curse. Sure. Because I knew from a very young age what I wanted to do. Yeah. You know, it's like when I performed at nine years old at the PTA talent show and get like six standing ovations during Folsom Prison Blues, yeah. you kind of start feeling like maybe I got something here. Yep. You know? Yep. And then, because you can tell the difference, your friends are like, "Can you bring your guitar to my yeah. birthday party?" It's like, <laughs> yeah, that's so when you can tell the you, difference. You feel like, okay, I'm kind of unique here. Yep. And and so, yeah, that's kind of what led me to, you know, feeling like, you know, yeah, I need to do this thing. And really, I, I tell my daughter all the time, it was the fear of failure. Yeah. Because I knew I didn't have an option. It was so. Oh, and he, so or he just in, didn't like the options. It was, yeah, it was <laughs> yeah. so much in front of me what I felt like I was born to do. Yeah. That I had to succeed somehow. Yeah. And I knew that, you know, God would have to be involved. Sure. And everything would have to fall in place. Yeah. And, and it, it took many years for me to really experience success enough to where I could be like, okay, now I can... I can buy a house and I can put my daughter through high school and college and all these yeah, things. Yeah, right. You know, it's like until then, I, I still was kind of like second guessing myself. And, and I was already in my my 30s, you know, early 30s. Sure. So, so when you guys first kind of started playing out and kind of doing gigs and stuff, were you doing it solo or did you have a band or how did you guys kind of get yourselves out there when you first started? Was it bands or just going out and doing acoustic yeah, solo kind of things? Getting a call like, hey, man, get this band. We hear you play. And I mean, at 16 years old, I was walking down the hall, you know, at high school. And and uh, this guy was like, hey, man, we got this little band. And it's like, you know. Do you remember the name of that band? Uh, it was West Wind. And the name of the, the guy was Clint Arrington. I'll never forget. Because I'm like, okay. So ended up going over there that evening. And, you know, before I left the house, I'm like digging through the closet for my Fender guitar and amp. Yep. Which I had kind of stuffed away. Sure. Because my dad said it was too loud. Yep. He wanted me to just play, you know, the acoustic. The acoustic, yeah. So I dug it out of the closet and I get over there and it's like, we're all kind of looking at each other. And it's like, do you know, can't you see? I'm like, yeah, yeah, I can, I can play that. And it's like, how about Good Time Charlie's Got the Blues? Yeah. And it's like, do you play lead? So that's how I learned is by somebody sure. saying, can you do it? Right. And you were willing to give it a shot. Yeah. And it's like, well, I guess if nobody else is going to do it, yeah, so I'm, I'm going to have to. And because Bryce plays by ear and I play by ear myself, we can hear things and learn to kind of pick them out on the guitar. Yep. So I feel like that, you know, pretty much defines even my melody approach and everything. It's everything I've heard through the years. I'm like a sponge and I've just absorbed right. it. And I just try to take everything that I love about it and create something new uh, that's going to appeal to somebody else. Hopefully an artist that will want to record the song, you know. And, and Bryce, when, when you first started kind of writing your own stuff. Mm -hmm. When did you, how did you get something where you're like, I think this is legit. Like, what was that process for you to 
find somebody, get it heard, and all the rest of it. Like, what was what was that? And what was that first song? Well, um, like the very first song I ever wrote. Do you do you even remember it? Yeah, I remember it. it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> that was the name of it. Was, it sucked. It was, I was in seventh grade. There's no no lie. I was in seventh grade and I had a crush on this girl. She was like the hottest girl in eighth grade, and she was really beautiful. And we went to a dance together. Or Dude, seventh grade up to eighth grade, and she was hot. Yeah, Good for she you. was beautiful, man. Good for beautiful, you. Beautiful girl, and she's awesome. She's still a friend of mine. And um, but anyway, I just had a crush on her, so I wrote this song about her, and. and uh, you know, with, with my guitar at, at my grandmother's house, grandparents' house at the time or whatever. And I just, uh, and I thought, and, and to be honest with you, um, you know, it was, I'm sure it was close to something I'd already heard. You sure. Know? I mean, sure. it was something, you know, three chords of something and, yep. and just a little lyric that I thought was cool. And, um, and then, you know, I, I didn't, uh, I, I don't, I didn't really study it that much in high school and stuff i mean sure. I, music i did for sure and yep. played a lot and was in all kinds of you know different things like mark said talent show here there and anywhere they'd have one i'd be in it and, and that kind of deal and but when i moved to nashville uh, in 93 i finished college at middle at mtsu down okay. there and had a couple years left and i finished down there and, and that's when i really got serious about hey man um you know if I really want to do this, I got to get serious about writing these songs because right. I was playing and I played with, you know, a lot of different pickers. I was lucky. I grew up about an hour and 20 minutes from Nashville in Kentucky. Yeah. And, and my buddy and I in high school, um, I was 17 and our senior year, we drove back and forth on Tuesday night. There was a, there was a place off Trinity Lane called the Broken Spoke and there was a band in there and on Tuesday nights, they had like an open mic thing. You could get up with the band and play couple songs you know yep. if they knew it that kind of deal and it was always fun and and uh, they'd let us in there long enough for me to get up and sing a couple songs and we had to leave because we weren't old enough you know back then and we weren't 18 yet and and uh i met several players you know just around really good players yeah uh that you know played with a lot of different artists hit artists and that kind of thing and then you know as you as you get to networking around nashville it's it's interesting to me and it was really interesting to me because when I first moved down there, I thought, man, this place is so big. You know, right. it's just like there's so many people. And then once you get on the inside of it, it's really it's small. Real small. Yeah. I mean, it's everybody knows everybody, yep. you know, and and uh, and I love that. And and out of that, I started, you know, going to writer's nights and that kind of thing, meeting other songwriters and writing songs with them and and uh, that kind of deal. I mean, I, an odd story. Um, I'm, my very first class at MTSU was a mass communications class that they made everybody take. And it was probably 150 people, auditorium seating, sure. you know, that kind of thing. And, and I walk in and sit down about, I don't know, six or eight rows up. And there's a guy, I mean, I'm, you know, boots, jeans, uh, belt, buckle, I team rope forever. And okay. so, I mean, I'm, you know, country boy, cowboy guy sitting in the class of people that didn't look anything like me. Sure. <laughs> um, and, uh, this guy sat down right behind me and a blue jean shirt kind of thing and a cap and, and, uh, and we said, hello, you know, that first day or whatever. Well, the next class, whatever he sat down behind me again, I get to talking to him and, and, you know, he's from Arkansas and, and wants to, you know, write songs and produce records and that kind of thing. That was his dream. He'd been to California and didn't stay out there, came to, came to Nashville, and he was kind of finished in college too. And anyway, long story short, that very first day, uh, his name was Odie Blackman, and we ended up writing nothing on but the radio oh, together. That's fantastic. Yeah, uh -huh. it's, it's, it's real interesting. What, what Mark said earlier that I find so interesting, and, and I know Mark well enough to know this, that he means it, is God's got to be involved in it. And, uh, and, you know, looking back on those kind of things, man, to me, it just, it, it, I mean, it's, it was a divine thing for that. Because, yeah. You're sitting that close and having a chat for a reason. Yeah, There's absolutely. A lot more to it. I mean, we walked in there together and didn't know each other the same class, you know, and, you know, through that, we got to be friends and, and, uh, you know, kept in touch and, you know, did things together. And, um, I remember he got his first cut for I did and, and we celebrated, you know, all kinds right. of stuff, just, just kind of that camaraderie amongst buddies right. and, and, um, you know, it, it, it's interesting how it all comes together.
So when you talk about collaborating on that song, how difficult how difficult is it to collaborate on a song versus write it yourself? What which do you guys what do you like better? Do you like to collaborate on a song or just flat out write write it yourself? I mean, what is that dynamic? I I'll tell you my take on it and then Mark can tell you his, but my take on it is this. I I really enjoy collaborations with the right people. Um and I don't I'll be honest with you. I don't really like, uh, you know, anymore. There's a lot of people on songs, and I, you know, if there's if it's any more than three, I'm out. And usually, I'd rather it just be a couple if we're collaborating on a song. Sure. Um, and I do enjoy writing by myself. I mean, I, I I've written a couple things lately by myself that I just like, just because I wanted to write them, and and uh, just you know, when it comes to you, it just comes to you, and and um, it, you know, those things just kind of kind of came fell in my lap so i just finished them but i really enjoy co-writing a lot especially with the right people that's awesome how about you mark yeah i uh well of course when you start out you really don't know what co-writing is you know right. you just want to be a writer and you start writing all these songs and you want to start and finish your song because it's in your head and you're trying to get better and better and better and it's like it's a very personal thing. You're kind of nervous about playing it for people, you know, it's like, um, but as time went on, even though I had early success with Ed Bruce, Tammy Wynette, Lee Greenwood, had had some things happening, I still, like I said earlier, I wasn't totally confident that I had totally figured it out. Okay. And so in the early 90s, MCA offered me a publishing deal. And that's when things really sped up because now they're putting me in the room with songwriters right. that are really good. And one of those writers was Tony Martin. And I remember the day he came into the room, he had a legal pad and a pencil over his ear. And he was the first writer that had shown up without a guitar. And I'm thinking, oh my God. So there's hope for me. I'm like, <laughs> yeah, I'm like, I'm thinking, so I guess he's expecting me to just come up with the melody and everything, uh -huh. you know? And so we get to talking and he's asking me what I'm up to. And I'm like, well, I've been out on the road with Tracy Bird. And I told him a story about this girl that was trying to get me to fly from, you know, where we were playing to the next town, but she was married. Oh. And I'm like, I just can't do that, girl. It's like, like you're, you know, you're attractive and everything. Yeah. But different circumstances, yeah, just, different times, yeah, right? Maybe so, but anyway, she, she was like, well, why don't you want to go? And I said, I do. And Tony said, but I don't. And I went, that's exactly it. That's how I felt, Tony. Yeah. So that was our first song that ended up on the Tim McGraw Everywhere yep. album. Yep. And then that just kicked off this beautiful, you know, co-write relationship where he was he was better as a lyricist as far as knowing what to say. Filling to in those gaps. The commercial and... sure. audience out there. Yeah. And then I had the melody strengths that that he didn't have. So we never got in each other's way. And it, it was just, yeah, it was awesome, you know. And most of my hits have been written with Tony. That's awesome. How did, have you guys ever written a song together? Mm -hmm. Mm hmm Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And how did you guys actually meet? Oh, I have. I I've mean, tell me fan. what you can tell me. Well, I've been, a, <laughs> I, I, I've been a fan of Mark for a long, long time. I His generate. I mean, like, Mark was ahead of me in the, in the like, kind of getting to town, I guess, or, or having hits, I would say, I, as far as that goes. And I admired him because I just, everything he wrote, I loved. And yeah. then he made a great record and I love that. And I mean, it's just, there it was a lot of, I mean, just everything. I, I just thought he was, you know, amazing uh, artist, writer, and great guitar player. I mean, all the stuff that you admire in somebody right. when they're that great. And, and so uh, I had been around him a few different times, run into him with other writers and that kind of thing, but we never really, I, I don't think we ever really like knew, knew each other till about the last probably three or four years, I guess, where we started writing and, and uh, hanging out and playing some shows together. And we had a, 
we had a, a really big hit down in Texas on an artist named Randall King that uh, was a number one Texas uh, artist uh, down there. And and, uh, and that was, golly, Nez, that was probably one of the first things we wrote together. I think it was. Um, there might have been a few songs before that. But I, I think we were just kind of, we were kind of warming up, you know, it's like. Getting to know each other, figuring you know, it out. Yeah. We both can write songs, and we're not going to write a bad song. No, right. Uh, so the songs were good, but they were really kind. I love that you just said that. We're not going to write a bad song. Why would yeah. you write? Why would you do that? <laughs> exactly. Why finish it? Yeah. Why, right. Yeah. yeah. Once why once it starts, I think you guys probably yeah. kind of know that's but, no good. But this was also <laughs> at a time when radio was drifting further and further away from traditional country. Yep. And so we would write a song and look at each other like, "What are we going to do with this?" <laughs> yeah. Right. And so when Randall came along. Immediately, there was a like a light bulb moment. Like, okay, here's a guy we can write those songs with that'll actually go cut them. And Bryce had that idea, "Hey Cowgirl," and, and you know, I believe we had actually started it, but we're kind of working on it. And then he had a write with Randall coming up, and that was our first Randall King write. Right. Yeah. So, as you're writing songs. How much are you writing? You talked about if it just com it just comes to you and this and that. Through throughout your career on the, like some of the hits that you've written, um, how much of it is that song came to you, or how much is it an artist said we we need a a song from you, pump this out, do this, or how much is it you write the song, you put it together, and you shop it around, or like how is that working for you guys in today's world? Well, I mean, in today's world today, we write a lot with artists because specific it's... to the artist, they want you to write a song. You write a couple from to pick from type of thing, and maybe they like one. And well, they we go with it type of thing. We write a lot with artists. A lot, a lot of the artists today are songwriters as well. You know, they're okay. in the room, and that's they. You know, that kind of in today's world, it it really helps your odds of getting it cut. Yeah, I mean, right. Their names on it. You know, sure. and and there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of writers. I mean, there's a lot of artists that are pretty dang good writers. Yeah. There's some that, you know, maybe aren't as good as others, but for the most part, there's some really great songwriters that really, um, you know, know what they want to do, sure. you know, know what kind of song they will sing and not sing and, and what they're looking for on their record. Oh man, I've written, you know, I, I don't need another ballad. I need to write some tempo stuff. Well, then we're not going to chase that rabbit, man. You know, we're going to try to figure out an idea for a up tempo song if they've got, you know, I've written a bunch of ballads and right. stuff because, you know, unless it's just something that just absolutely lends itself to, sure. to being that. But but you want to help facilitate them and and getting on the record because, I you know, we got enough songs sitting on the shelf, man. Yeah, we right. need them cut. Yeah. And and uh, so I mean, as far as that goes in today's market, as songwriter uh, go, like where Nez and I are you know, as, as doing our best to try to help these artists say what they want to say and do, you know, do what they want to do. I mean, it, it behooves us as writers to figure out what slot are you looking for on your record? Yeah, we want to sense. try to fill it. Right. That makes sense. Now you, you brought up, you've got a, you know, enough songs on the shelf. What's for each of you, like, have, do you have a song that was sitting there for like six years and then all of a sudden you like, Gave it to somebody and said, hey, try this, because I think this is a fit for you. And it actually turned into something. Do you, do you have some songs that have been sitting there for a while that all of a sudden turned into, like, a song that would fit on somebody's album for an artist? Yeah, I mean, for me, it was nothing on but the radio. That song was five and a half years old. That's before. unbelievable. And Gary had passed stuff. on it. He had passed on it the record before. And everybody had it on hold. I mean, T-Bird had it on hold for a while. Um, George had it on hold for a while. Uh, there was different guys that had that song. Who never cut it. And then when Gary came around for the next record again, I made sure he heard it. And you know, then then they they cut it. That's awesome, Mark. Have you had, have any that were sitting on the shelf for a bit? Oh yeah, there's there's a handful of them. Um, none that were big hits. But you know, my dad, he you know he was man, he was a tough sell on a song because he just loved country music. And so when I was young, I was trying to be innovative and different and unique. And I played him my new stuff, and he just looked at me and he said, son, when are you going to write something George Jones can sing? Well, that just crushed me. Right, right, you know? yeah. 
So I wrote this song called You Never Know How Good You Got It Till You Ain't Got It No More. And I remember coming back from a gig in Houston. Sure. I finished it up. I'm thinking, I'll show him. You know, I played it for him. He liked it. Yeah. Now, Tracy Bird had the first cut on it. But a year after my dad passed away, George Jones cut that song. And so... That's goosebumps. That was right like... <laughs> Seriously, I don't know. You've, you've probably heard that story oh, yeah. a million times and you still get boos. 17, yeah, yeah. 18 Such years, cool you know. Uh, uh, and then there were other, you know, songs that were laying around. That's what used to make it so fun to be a writer because you really didn't know what was going to happen day sure. to day. Right. You could just get a call out of the blue and somebody say, hey, you know, Joe Diffie just cut, you know, one of your songs. Like, what? What song? You know? That's awesome. And now it's like... You know, you're checking your email for like something. Like, is anything going on? Is there <laughs> yeah. a hold? Is there Does somebody a... still? Ha yeah. yeah. And it's just that there's so much of the artist, writer, you know, co-writes that unless you write it with them, you know, chances are they're not going to go back and dig in your catalog. Right. But I do have a number of Texas artists that'll, you know, hit me up for songs, and That's I'll send awesome. them some of the a material. Where right. you used to, you'd start at the top of the list. Yeah. Work your way down yeah. from George Strait to <laughs> Tim McGraw to Kenny Chesney. So I'll send them songs and they'll be like, can I have this? I'm like, sure. I mean, because yeah. if I don't give it to you, nobody's ever going to hear it. Right. So how, kinda, how tough is that contract selling a song world? Is it Does that get trickier or is it pretty straightforward in the business now? Uh, I mean, as far as getting it cut. As far as getting it cut, but also getting something for it. You know, it's like... Well, that's, I mean, you know. is, that, is that all over? Is, is that like no. a hard negotiation or is it pretty much standard? Yeah, yeah it is. Bit? I mean, it's, yeah, they're, I mean, you know, our, our publishers, they, you know, have admi administration parts of our, uh, of sure. our publishing companies and they, they take care of all that kind of stuff. And, and, uh, um, you know, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, I mean, we just get a rate, you know, for, yeah. for an album sale or a stream or, a re you know, song on yeah. the radio on terrestrial radio and that kind of thing. And, and then, you know. That's what we do, and I know uh, Nez enjoyed the '90s a lot because he was back there when they were just selling. Everybody was selling platinum or double platinum, and you know, I mean, those days are gone for yeah. the writer these days. You know, and if you're not, I mean, you know, as far as just like a job, like a career, you know, and say, hey, man, I, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to be a songwriter. That's what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. I'm going to write songs, um, man. I don't know. That's tough. I yeah. mean, that's a, that's a tough deal to do anymore. Because if you know, if you're not having, if you're not consistently having hits that get to radio, man, you're you know, you're just there's no way yeah. to make a living. I mean, it's right. just not. That's that's just the reality of where we are. Right. So, uh, you guys have played a lot of bars, a lot of venues. If you uh, if you could go back, if if, if somebody called you. What's that place that you're going and playing? They call you, say, hey, we want you to come in and play. What's that place that you just always felt at home? You always would want to play. If, it, if you can fit in your schedule and you're there, it, it just makes you feel like you. Uh, you know, in, in all honesty, I mean, anything around home for me, just because that's where I started and that's where I grew up. Sure. And it's, you know, you know, you're going to have a good crowd. And, and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, you, it, it you sucks know, to play in front of three chance, people. Yeah, pretty good <laughs> chance they're, they're going to show up. Right, you know, right, that right. That kind of thing. Yeah. But yeah, um, you know, for me, it, it'd be, you know, whether it was a, you know, a fair or a moose lodge or a theater or just you know and where i'm from i mean that's just the convention center i mean that you know those places that you played as you were coming up and learning and and uh you know getting your feet wet before you decided hey man i really want to take a chance at moving to nashville and making this thing work right. and <laughs> and those places you know to me and I, and i guess that's selfish to say that but the reason would be because i know it would be a good crowd. And they, you know, they, I mean, you just have that love of, hey, man, got to go see, you know, Bryce tonight. He's playing it, whatever, you right. know. That's my, that would be for me. How about you, Mark? Yeah, I feel the same way. I'm trying to get back to my roots. You know, I've played a lot of honky tonks, you know, Thule's in Phoenix, Arizona, Grizzly Rose in Denver, up in Canada. There were some great 
honky tonks up there. But they drink up in Canada, man. They, they know how to have fun up in Canada. Oh, yeah. They definitely oh. drink. If you there. if you find yourself surrounded by Canadians in yeah. Vegas, you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough. That's a tough night. But what I enjoy now is just sitting around the house, jamming with my daughter. You know, she's playing fiddle, and that's awesome. And so it's kind of taken me back to where I started, and it reminds me of why. You're doing I love doing. this yeah. so much because it's easy to forget that when you get so involved in the business aspect and you've been making a really good living and all of a sudden you're like, it's a good thing that I, uh, you know, I set up that IRA, you know, and have a retirement because if I hadn't done that, I would really be stressed out right now, yeah. you know, because it, it just went away so fast. Yeah. Uh, I was down in Mobile, Alabama a few weeks ago and hanging out, you know, with my girlfriend's family and and we were actually uh, kind of, you know, paying tribute to her dad that passed away a year ago. And he was a musician and he had kind of mentored all these local you know, musicians. They were in their 20s and 30s, you know, and they started dropping by you know, the house. And they didn't know really anything about me. Right. It's like, well, do, do, do something. And so uh, my girlfriend was like, well, do, do one you wrote, you know. And they were just like, what? Get out of here, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, right. And it's like, and I'm listening to these kids play. I mean, the first song that one of the boys played was Makeup and Faded Blue Jeans by Merle Haggard. Sure. And I went, he said, I bet you're shocked to, you know, actually hear me sing that. I said, I am. He said, well, I'm shocked too because you're the first guy that's played it right. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That's fantastic. So it's like suddenly <laughs> I'm all inspired because it just told me that country music still lives out there. It does. There's some very much there's so. some young singers and songwriters that, that love it. Yeah. And I just hope that it can find a way back to mainstream where guys like that would have a chance. Because, I mean, he should be doing it for a living. He was that good. And I'm just like, dude, you know. But Well, I'll tell you right now, I, I think if I, had, if I had any choice to it and any control of it, we'd be uh, pulling all those songs off the shelf and putting those out there for people <laughs> to hear because I think that's I think that's what we need. And uh, I can't thank you guys enough for being a part of this podcast and joining me today and getting a, a chance to get to know you guys and sharing your stories and who you are. And um, it's real important. It's real important where you're from, what you've done, how you look at it, the values of it, the integrity of it. You know, I can't I can't say thank you enough for being part of this podcast. Well, thank you, thank man. You. Thanks for having I appreciate us. Appreciate it. All right, we're out of here. Interstate Music Podcast. And uh, we've got Mark Nessler and Bryce Long. And uh, uh, pay attention to these guys. Follow them. They're uh, pretty good stuff. See you guys. <laughs> Thanks.